The location of Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, has baffled archaeologists and scholars alike for years. The Bible talks about this mountain through the pages of the book of Exodus. It chronicles God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt and the place where Moses received the laws of God. But did Mount Sinai ever really exist? Or was its biblical account only myth and legend? Larry Williams and Bob Cornock are an unlikely pair. One a sophisticated commodities trader and the other a former Southern California cop. But the friendship they forged would unlock a world of mystery that neither could have ever expected. Well, I became a policeman at a very young age, 21 years old. I was an investigator, uh, FBI trained, uh, uh, really enjoyed the investigative side of it, the research side of it. Well, I trade uh, commodities, primarily the bond market, and um, that is a wonderful thing because it does give me the opportunity to do other things in my life, other businesses, other interests. Uh, such as uh, archaeological interest. And I just had a sort of a sixth sense for finding where criminals would be and hunting them down and be able to find them. I, I think uh, if somebody were to sum me up, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none of them. <laughs> but I just like adventure in my life. I met Larry Williams through a mutual friend and uh, at the very beginning I thought he was a pretty colorful guy and immediately we hit it off. I think there was an instantaneous rapport with Bob and I. Um, Bob's um, well, he's a very strong Christian, uh, and I, I wouldn't classify myself as being that. Um, he's also a guy's guy. Here's a guy who had attained a lot of wealth, yet he had a real kind spirit about himself, a real adventurous spirit, a person who's willing to go out and take physical risks. Yeah, I mean, he just stood on his own legs. I just thought, wow, this is great. This, this is a strong statement about Christians to see somebody like this. The search for the real Mount Sinai would be no easy task. Pieces of evidence would have to fit together like a complex puzzle. And like a crime scene investigation, every lead had to be looked at. This was a process Bob Cornock knew well. Well, the crime scene always talks to you. There's a story there. I let it tell me a story. And the Bible told me a story about Mount Sinai, and I think that's why we were very successful. Whenever you're doing uh, the type of work we do, you need to do some real simple things, take measurements, observations, and do it with a very clear mind, not a, oh, I want to prove a point mind, but what do the facts show? You, you can't have a, a conclusion, and a, a premise, and then look for the data to support it. But this wasn't the first adventure for Bob and Larry. Both had climbed Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey in search of the Ark of Noah. But this adventure started with a mysterious letter and a relationship with an Apollo astronaut. Well, I met Jim Rowan through a mutual friend. He was a unique guy. He was a piece of history. He was the eighth man to walk on the moon. He was an Apollo 15 astronaut. Jim Irwin gave me a letter that had been written by a man who had been in Saudi Arabia, how he had seen a mountain that could be Mount Sinai, and here were the directions, and said he couldn't go back, but maybe somebody could. And I read the letter, I'm like, this is for me, this is my thing, I'm going. I called Bob up, and Bob said, yeah, when? You know, there wasn't any hesitation at all, yeah, let's do this, and, and you need that type of an attitude. What should the real Mount Sinai look like? How do you know what you're looking for? The men chose to make the Bible their guide, to search out its specific claims about the mountain, and to follow them, literally. We knew we had to find the Exodus route. We had to find where they crossed through the Red Sea. We needed to find the Bitter Springs of Mara that the Bible talks about. We needed to find the 70 palms and 12 springs of Elam that the Bible talks about. We needed to find a cave there. We needed to find boundary markers around the mountain. We had to look for a large altar where they made the golden calf worshiping the Apis or Hathor, the Egyptian pagan bull god. We needed to find an altar at the foot of the mountain where Moses built an altar and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. We needed to find a rock that water gushed forth. The Bible describes it as the rock of Horeb. It needed to be a very pronounced rock that was split. We needed to find a mountain where God descended in flames of a furnace. We needed to find all these things to find the real Mount Sinai. It's refreshingly simple. They've taken the, the biblical record at face value they had more or less a, a grocery list of what they were looking for. Is this here? Let's look and see if it's here. If it's not, that's fine. If it is, that's exciting. 
but difficulty and peril lay ahead, and Apollo 15 astronaut Jim Irwin knew it. He called his friend Bob Cornick with a warning. He knew of the dangers, and he expressed to me, Bob, you need to be aware that this is a dangerous mission. He said, but I was confronted with that decision whether to go on a dangerous mission once myself, going to the moon. And he said, when they closed that capsule door, he said it was the hardest thing is to hear that door clang shut, knowing that I was committed to go. He said, are you committed to go? And I weighed all of the pluses and the negatives, and I felt that uh, it was worth the risk to potentially discover this great find, this lost mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Examining Bible passages, old maps, and using scholarly input, they delved into their research. Clues and evidence began to mount. The very best evidence pointed to Arabia, and specifically a mountain called Jabal al-Lawz in Saudi Arabia. Well, we had heard stories about other men that had been to the area of Arabia, and actually claimed that they'd seen a scorched rock peak and some other things around this mountain, but unfortunately they were arrested and all their film was confiscated and they were sent from the country and no one really believed them but Jim said this could have merit because the Bible clearly says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia it's in the ancient land of Midian where Moses received the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai Galatians 4:25 says plainly Mount Sinai is in Arabia well that's not the Sinai Peninsula and then when you check cross-check that with the reference to Midian you'll find that Bible maps and secular maps put Midian on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba in the land of Saudi Arabia. Scripture was pointing there and I was astounded to find out that many of the scholars have ignored what Scripture has said and they focus on this mountain in the Sinai Peninsula called Jabal Musa or Mount Sinai with no evidence at all to support that Mount Sinai is even in the Sinai Peninsula. Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula um, is highly contested for a couple of reasons. First, they've never found a shred of evidence that anybody ever camped there. There's no pottery, there's no remains, there's no campsite. In fact, there's no water. The site was uh, named to be uh, Mount Sinai by a fortune teller in about the third century AD. And without any evidence, people have just continually told this story over and over again. And if you say a story enough times, people start to believe that it's history. It is not history at all. There's no evidence at all to support that Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula is Mount Sinai. What really was in the back of my mind, every time you read the Bible, it says, when they left, they went out of Egypt. Uh, I counted one time how many times that occurs in Exodus, so like 72 times the phrase out of Egypt, out of Egypt, out of Egypt. So that would mean they couldn't be in Egypt. And the Sinai Peninsula at that time was in control of the Egyptian army. They had they mined turquoise, they mined copper, they had standing armies there. And we know from archaeology that the pharaoh had uh, a significant military presence throughout the Sinai Peninsula. And so it seems reasonable that God would have led the children of Israel as far away from an Egyptian military presence as possible. When I really had that insight, that was my compelling thing to keep going on this. That was the first yeah, the, the people that say it's in uh, the Sinai Peninsula don't have a clue. But if we're talking about uh, good scholarship that provides the evidence to support the integrity of the scriptures, uh, the traditional site of Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula really doesn't have anything to recommend it. Archaeologists have dug up that entire mountain from top to bottom. They haven't found one speck of evidence to show that this is the real Mount Sinai. So we must conclude that either the event of the Exodus didn't occur, or the Mount Sinai that we know in the Bible is located somewhere else. And all the arrows pointed that Mount Sinai should be in Saudi Arabia, ancient land of Midian, and that's where we centered our search. Getting into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is no easy task. It would take some resourceful and some rather creative methods. The first obstacle was a visa, getting into Saudi Arabia. You just don't go into Saudi Arabia unless you have received uh, a letter from the government. Uh, we, we had a letter from the, uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, probably a promotional letter, a business letter or something, and the letterhead. So we took the letterhead and the king's signature and just typed up a little letter that basically said, please give Bob Cornuk and Larry Williams immediate access to everything, let them in the country. I want these guys, I want them now. And we took that letter uh, and faxed that letter to the Saudi embassy. So they got the letter set to the 
time zone and the phone number of the king, so it looked like a legitimate letter from the king came. And then we went on down and said, gee, did you get a letter from the king? <laughs> I said, oh, you guys, yes, so what can we do to help you? And that was really what allowed us to, to get, gain access into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The story of Moses leading the children of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt has captured generations with what may be the greatest miracle described in the Bible. Hotly pursued by Pharaoh's army, the fleeing children of Israel came to the Red Sea, and at God's command, Moses stretched out his hands, and the sea parted. The Bible says, with a wall of water on the left and on the right, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Scholars have long wondered about the crossing location, and skeptics were convinced this miracle could never have happened because the crossing site hadn't been found. There's three potential crossing sites that have been suggested. One is that they went through not uh, the Red Sea, but the Sea of Reeds, a lake. One is at the very top of the Suez Canal. And then there's a third view, which is down further, uh, which would take the tribes almost directly across to St. Catharines or the traditional Mount Sinai site. It's just too deep to cross through. If you have elderly and animals and children and all those people crossing through as the waters parted, it'd be like going down the Grand Canyon and coming up the other side. Again, if we take a Bitter Lakes interpretation of the Exodus or even the northern tip of the Gulf of Suez, uh, it would be uh, quite likely that military commanders of the caliber that Pharaoh possessed would have divided their chariot forces and sent part of that force around to cut the Hebrews off on the other side. If the Bible's true, um, there's got to be evidence. So either the Exodus didn't occur or it did occur and nobody's looked in the right place. So it's a, let's go look at another place. For wherever the crossing site is, that's going to dictate where the mountain is and vice versa. So all these pieces need to fit together in order to come to a proper conclusion. The Bible says that the wilderness has hemmed them in. We needed to find a place that they were in a hopeless situation. And as Pharaoh came upon them, they had the mountains to their back and the water in front of them. And they cried out to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Now the Bible says that they crossed through the Red Sea at Yom Suf. That means sea of land's end. Pushed to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, the Israelites were faced with Pharaoh's chariots on one side and the Red Sea on the other. Without a miracle, they were doomed. We found an underwater land bridge that went from the tip of the Sinai Peninsula over into Arabia, called the Jackson Reef area. The crossing extends out across the straits, so we have pictures where Bob or myself are standing on this land bridge at high tide, and the water's up around my waist. We went on a diving expedition to survey this land bridge and it's this massive land that comes out of the depths of the deep ocean and creates a roadway through the sea to the other side. The people have to be able to walk. They can't just uh, slide down a cliff on one side, um, muck their way through the, through the silt and slime and somehow scale a cliff on the other side to get out of this basin. Some type of um, submarine topography had to exist so that uh, as God supernaturally uh, parted the waters, the, the path that they would take could be dried out by the wind that accompanied that event. This underwater landmass comes up hundreds of feet from the deep. Now eroded by tides and shipping lanes, it remains to this day a testament to God's awesome power. Also, there's a mountain range there that precludes the people from escaping in any direction. They were hemmed in by the wilderness at this point. They had no place to go except through the sea. People usually think the water's going back this way and then closing. Well, it could have just gone this way and then come back in. It fit the timelines. Could you get across in this time period? Yes, it wasn't too far across. I suspect that's where the crossing took place. It's physically possible. This was straight up from the depths of the sea. This was created by God Almighty being omnipotent, knowing that the children of Israel would need this escape route. Now across, the explorers felt confident they had found strong evidence of the Exodus. But with a foreboding desert stretched before them, the question remained, where did the children of Israel go from here? First, as they got out on the other side, they, they rejoiced. The Bible says they went three days into the wilderness and they found the bitter springs of Marah. 
Um, they should have stopped at some springs along the way, some bitter water springs. We figured it's about a 30 to 40 kilometer distance would be a three day journey going through the sand with all those people and having animals and the elderly. And 33 kilometers inland, sure enough, we found these springs sitting right there by the road and we went over and, and tasted the water and it was so bitter you couldn't touch it to your tongue. We opened the Bible up and we started thumbing through the pages. We're thinking, what are we going to see next? And the Bible tells us that they came to the 70 palms and 12 springs of Elam. As we're driving along, uh, here's a whole bunch of palms, a whole bunch of springs. And uh, this, this like really, really blew me away. And within the palm trees, we found several springs of clear water bubbling up out of the ground. Now, today, they have put these concrete encasements around these springs so that the water doesn't seep out into the sand. But we did find evidence of 12 springs of water bubbling up out of the ground, as the Bible says, amongst the palm trees. What would come next would be a surprise from deep within tombs. We first noticed I had a real old map and it said ruins, and we couldn't find these ruins. Eventually, we found these ruins at this area where the the 79 palms and all the springs are, and the ruins are Egyptian tombs. There was a fence going around it with barbed wire. There was military guards placed around it. There was police jeeps driving up and down the street patrolling. And a local person said, oh, well, we call those the Caves of Moses. Like, you know, like we'd say, yeah, there's a McDonald's on the corner. So, part of their culture. Once you start with these people, well, yeah, Moses came through here. Don't you know that? What's wrong with you? The legend of the Exodus was still alive in the Saudi desert. We had the chance to talk to a Syrian archaeologist. He heard us speaking English and came over and uh, wanted to strike up a conversation. And we asked him right off the bat, what is in those caves that you're doing archaeological research on at the edge of town? And he said, oh, we found writings in these caves that say that the prophet Musa, which is Arabic for Moses, that he came through this way with his nation of people, and that he camped right here by the water. The Saudi Arabian desert is an unforgiving place. Stretching for hundreds of miles with few roads, temperatures can reach a blistering 130 degrees. This is no place to get lost. Uh, we just followed directions, and, and they were thoroughly confusing. Uh, we got lost uh, on numerous occasions. We, we started traveling deeper and deeper into the desert and the mountainous regions of northern Saudi Arabia. You don't know desert till you've been in Saudi Arabia. It's really hot. Just dry. Just It just goes through your body. It's a tough country to get around in, winding trails. And we must have spent three or four hours backtracking, going back and forth, trying to get there before eventually we uh, circuitously got a Bedouin to show us the general area to get us there. Uh, we started talking to him about Jabal Musa and uh, they said Jabal El Laws and uh, they, uh, we said, can you take us there? Jabal El Laws, Jabal Musa. And they said they could. So they drove us to this area and they pointed out this mountain and then walked around. He walked around the tip of this little hill and he looked like that. He looked and then he coming and said, look, come on over, and he pointed, and that was what he said, and then he got and he left. What are they afraid of? What is so frightening about this mountain called Jabal El Laws? He, he was very kind to show us, though, because I don't know if we would have found it without him. I think the strongest argument is the Bedouin tradition that this is indeed the true Mount Sinai. The Bedouins have no religious investment they need to protect. Before we went to the mountain, there was a schoolyard. The man from the schoolyard, the teacher, we went to him and said, Jabal Musa. He said, ah, yes, Jabal El Laws. He pointed up to this mountain looming on the horizon with a scorched rock peak. And he said, that is the real Mount Sinai. That is Jabal Musa, the mountain of Moses. Could this be the holy mountain of God, Mount Sinai? As they drove towards the mountain, hearts pounding and eager to learn more, they soon found that this wasn't going to be as easy as they thought. And we found, to our amazement, that there's a fence going around the mountain. What we saw was fences, fenced off all around the mountain, 
great big signs in Arabic and English. That's the only sign we saw in Saudi Arabia that was both Arabic and English, other than at the airports. Everything else was Arabic. But it's real, real clear, don't go behind this fence, archaeological stuff, etc. We felt that we'd just find this mountain all alone in the middle of nowhere. Little did we know that this mountain is being protected by the Saudi government. But there was a rebellion at Mount Sinai. The Israelites forgot the God that brought them to safety and built and worshipped a golden calf made from the gold they carried out of Egypt. Bob and Larry wondered if they might find an altar. And then uh, we said, well, let's see if we can find this altar site. So Bob went off, and Bob, of course, having a better compass and sense of direction than I did, he went, just like, choom, went right to it, thought, come on over here, come on over here. I went like, don't yell so loud, <laughs> they're going to hear us. <laughs> and. Uh, you, you know, he just nailed it right away. And sure enough, we found this altar that was about 30 feet high and 30 feet across. And there it was. Um, I'll call it an altar site. Uh, a pile of rocks in the middle of very flat, barren land. Rocks are maybe 20-some feet high, maybe a little higher than that. Very flat at the top. And these petroglyphs of these bovine figures uh, about halfway up, etched into the rock. Not painted, etched into the rock. What you are seeing is exclusive amateur high eight footage of the Jabal Al Laws area. This high eight footage was smuggled out of the country at great risk. But the most unusual point is that cattle are not indigenous to Saudi Arabia. It's sheep country, it's goat country, there's no cattle there. So to see a a cattle, a cow figure on an extremely old petroglyph also really got me going, saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're onto something here. Later on, we did find that they were Egyptian artwork and that this probably was the altar that they made the golden calf because we have this ancient bull god, Apis, inscribed on several places on this huge altar. Now, this altar was man-made. It would have taken hundreds, maybe even thousands of men to move the boulders in place to make this altar. Of course, they had the entire workforce of Pharaoh at their disposal, and they did have the skill of working on large-scale projects. The petroglyphs are representing Egyptian cattle, which of course are not native to that part of the country at all, and certainly would have been the kinds of cattle that they brought from the land of Egypt. It's not a place where someone would go and uh, counterfeit an Egyptian petroglyph uh, in the middle of nowhere where it's never going to be seen for no reason. So I think that's probably the most significant thing that was found there. And I think that was the sense I had, like a whoa, you know, this isn't just kids' game anymore. This, this stuff's here. This is, this is really, this is here. This is real. We then traveled along, and we found these rock piles, thinking them to be grave sites of some kind, large grave sites. They're about 20 feet across and about five feet high. And we're driving around, but oh, there's another one. And then it clicked, hey, wait a minute, the Bible says that there should be boundary markers around the mountain, that Moses put boundary markers so people wouldn't go up on the mountain. If they did, they'd be killed. We found that they're placed precisely every 400 yards in a two-mile semicircle going around the mountain. But there's a nice smooth line of right around the mountain where, where we wanted to go up the mountain, where people would want to go up the mountain. Here are these markers, which to Bob and I, we call them boundary markers because it fits. And the Bible says these things should be here, and they're there, they're not there. For fear of being detected, Bob and Larry headed into the mountains to wait out the day. For Bob, astronaut Jim Irwin's warning was coming back. With guards, fences, guns, and dogs, getting caught this time could lead to the traditional Saudi punishment, decapitation. We camped at the base of the mountain that night, and then we had intended to go at about midnight and go back in there and penetrate in behind the fence. But about 10.30, Larry became antsy. He couldn't sleep, and I couldn't sleep either. And as we laid there, and our hearts are pounding. We're ready to go. And we started, we're talking together, and we're saying, hey, let's just do it. But we went across the valley using night scopes. And then the next thing we saw were guards. <laughs> because the, the guard house is there, and we can see, especially with infrared glasses, a couple guards smoking cigarettes, because you can see a little burn on infrared glasses, you know, almost a mile away. 
We went, actually went around them, and then we started heading up the side of this mountain. And at night, we had to use the night scopes to find out. You know, those shadows are very precarious. We thought we might fall down a cliff or something, but with a night scope, you could see a trail. Uh, pretty good moon outside. We're still using the infrared glasses. The Bible says that there's an altar site of uncut stones. And sure enough, we came across this altar that was 60 foot by 60 foot. It had two wing sections. It had a center rock ridge that went down the middle of it. There's an altar site, a huge uh, uh, formation, uh, rock formation, uh, kind of a, a triangular uh, shape. Well, sure enough, <laughs> this is uncut stones. Um, and it's about 60 feet on both of these wings that come up are about 60 feet long. The uniqueness was that it's placed right at the foot of the mountain, exactly as the Bible says. Next to it we found this area where there was um, burnt ash and uh, you can see uh, that it was just about oh, 12 feet by 12 feet and it was an altar site where they maybe um, did burnt offering ceremonies. Only Hebrews do burnt offerings, so it's unique because we felt that we had found a Hebrew altar site in the middle of a Muslim country. Also, and, and this is the most compelling evidence to me, we found again these marble um, columns, uh, about uh, this big around, about that big around, and they're usually about this high, and they're just strewn all over there. Moses built an altar and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And they had carved these pillars to stack one on top of another to form these pillars. The marble column itself, the stone is so unique. Uh, how this got there and why? Why there? Why would you find uh, marble stones, column stones in say the middle of the Grand Canyon or in the Mojave Desert or the Gobi Desert? I mean like, whoa, what's going on here? Something went on. Bob and Larry knew what they believed had gone on at this holy site. And if true, it could be one of history's greatest archaeological discoveries. It was, a, it was a very surreal moment. We stood there for a moment and I turned to Larry and I said, Larry, I said, what are we doing here? And without breaking stride, he turned to me and he smiled and said, Bob, we're making history. Uh, this isn't just an adventure, this isn't just a trip. Uh, we've come halfway around the world and uh, we got to get pictures of this stuff to take out to the rest of the world now. We got to get out of here. That desert over there is not like any other desert. It was a suffocating heat. We, we consumed mass quantities, prodigious amounts of water we consumed. And so the people would have cried out to Moses, as the Bible says they did, and cried out for water. Bob knew well the biblical account. God's command to Moses was to strike the rock at Horeb and water would come gushing out for his thirsty nation. Could this have really happened? Would there be any evidence remaining of this? And most important, could this rock still be in existence? It must have been a very, a very pronounced rock because the Bible describes it as the split rock at Horeb. You would have been able to see it from miles away a very unique rock, and there was a very unique rock indeed there, right on the west side of the mountain. It goes up 40 feet from this knoll area, and it has a fracture right down the middle. It goes from top to bottom, about 19 inches wide. Uh, below this rock, you can see where the water has washed it smooth, that it came out in millions and maybe billions of gallons of water that poured forth over these rocks. This is not sandstone. This is dense granite rock that the water has rushed over, thus making it smooth now. This part of the world only gets a half an inch of rain every 10 years. It's impossible for this little rainfall to wash away an entire mountainside and make the granite boulders smooth Evidence was mounting, but how would the Israelites get enough water for an entire nation of perhaps two million people? They would have needed a lake of water because they had up to two million people there possibly. We found an area that water came in and filled up this granite basin and it filled it up and it was several acres in size. 
with time running out. The explorers knew that if they were going to hike to the top of Jebel al Lors, they should do it soon. Well, we're going to go for it and go to hike to the top of the mountain. The Bible is real clear about what's on Mount Sinai. It says that uh, uh, there should be a cave there. The Elijah went to Mount Sinai, uh, Mount Horeb, and uh, was in a cave. The Bible says that Elijah visited a cave there, actually stood at the mouth of the cave with the cloak across his face. And so we had to find a cave. Well, on this mountain, there's a cave. Um, and it's like, boy, more stuff is here. There's no cave at the traditional Mount Sinai or any other of the other supposed Mount Sinai's. This Mount Sinai had a cave. Like a puzzle, the pieces were all fitting together. But what would they discover at the top of Jebel al Lors? If this was the holy mountain that God touched, what would they find? We saw looming up in front of us this mountain, about 8,000 foot peak, Jebel al Lors. And the very unique thing about the top of it is that it's black on the top. Why is the top of this mountain black and none of the other mountains around there are black on the top? And it's like such an unusual, just a visual image. And we were drawn to climb this mountain to see what these unique black rocks were. And so the climb began and we eventually got there. When we got to the top, we found these rocks that were blackened on the outside. They were shiny black, uh, as if some kind of an external heat source melted them. Which fits again with scripture that says that this mountain was touched by God and by fire and lightning and whatever. So it would make sense it would be blackened. And God said he descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. And then uh, Larry said, hey, they may be volcanic, so I took a big rock and I slammed it down on top of another one. We broke off a chunk of this and we were amazed when we looked at this rock that it was melted, crusty on the outside, but it was granite on the inside. We broke other rocks in the area. Sure enough, all of them, they were melted black on top, were granite on the inside. Bob made some writings in his Bible, uh, and I think he had a real strong uh, uh, religious, spiritual feeling. Um, we left the message up there in a bottle that basically acknowledges, A, we were there, and that we came uh, as friends, uh, not to harm anybody, but uh, uh, on a quest, a spiritual, religious quest, an intellectual quest to know what's here. Um, the only problem, we just had such difficulty getting in the country. Um, but we felt that to establish, to find out the truth uh, was well worth um, the risks that we took or the error of our ways for it, our entry into the country. And, and I'll take responsibility for it fully. And I, it was just to me, it was like, sometimes you got to do things in your life. And um, right or wrong, uh, it was done. And I think we wanted to kind of address that uh, at the top of the mountain. This was holy ground felt totally unworthy to be there. I felt that I shouldn't be there, that I should get down from this mountain immediately. Close to the mountain, we found a battlefield. This could be where they had the Battle of Refundum, where they fought the Amalekites. This is where Moses raised his hand by Aaron and Hur, and they won the battle. When his arms dropped, they began losing the battle. We also um, found around the mountain um, these circled rock ringed ancient dwelling sites. I don't know what they are, but certainly a sign that there was a lot of civilization there at one time. We found evidence of kilns where they would have made their pottery. Also, there's a cleft rock on this mountain. The Bible refers to a cleft rock being on the mountain. There's a tree be between the cleft rock. There's all this stuff fit. Now, when Moses was asked to make the Ark of the Covenant, God gave him distinct descriptions and materials to be used. And one of those materials was acacia wood. But sure enough, we found uh, there is a grove of acacia wood trees.
God always revealed himself in the pillar of fire, or the burning bush, or descending on Mount Sinai in flames of a furnace, as the Bible tells us. And right by the split rock at Horeb, there's a burnt patch of rocks. I think that's very unique because God called Moses and the elders to the split rock at Horeb. And right by the split rock of Horeb, we do find a patch of burnt rock. Why is the mysterious Jabal al-Law so heavily guarded? Why won't the Saudis reveal this holiest of sites to the world? It appears as if Saudi Arabia does not want the world to know that this is the real Mount Sinai. They obviously have some strong religious and political differences with Israel. So what happens if a most holy Christian site, most holy Jewish site, is found to be in a Muslim country? Uh, would you like tourists in? <laughs> and that's just the beginning of the problem. How do you handle this? So naturally, they would keep it from the world. They put a fence around it. They tell people to stay away. We found something. We found something. We've got to go back and show this to the world. Some of the other great ruins of civilization have been found by people just stumbling onto them or adventurers. And then in come the professionals to separate the wheat from the shaft. Let's not forget that the most significant archaeological discovery to date, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, uh, were made by Bedouin Shepherd Boy. And I think it requires archaeologists to go in and comb this entire area, have people who know more about this than we know about it, look at it, I and mean, we're kind of uh, intrepid explorers and we stumble into things. So I say, you know, now we got stuff we can take back and show to these people, and they can say, you're all wet, or yeah, we want to look at this. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think the Saudi government will ever allow anyone to go in there under any circumstances and search and research in the area. Every time you read the Bible, it says, when they left, they went out of Egypt. That would mean they couldn't be in Egypt. Many of the scholars have ignored what scripture has said. There's no evidence at all to support that Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula is Mount Sinai. People that say it's in the, the Sinai Peninsula don't have a clue. Now the Bible says they cross through the Red Sea at Yom Suf. That means Sea of Land's End. We needed to find a place that they were in a hopeless situation. Some type of uh, submarine topography had to exist. We found an underwater land bridge that went from the tip of the Sinai Peninsula over into Arabia. Where, wherever the crossing site is, that's going to dictate where the mountain is. The Bible says they went three days into the wilderness and they found the bitter springs of Mara. We found these springs sitting right there by the road and we went over and, and tasted the water and it was so bitter you couldn't touch it to your tongue. As we're driving along, uh, there's a whole bunch of palms, a whole bunch of springs. Twelve springs of water bubbling up out of the ground as the Bible says. And a local person said, oh well we call those the caves of Moses. But he came for this way with his nation of people and he camped right here by the water. I think the strongest argument is the Bedouin tradition that this is indeed the true Mount Sinai. The Bedouins have no religious investment they need to protect. He pointed up to this mountain looming on the horizon with the scorched rock peak. He said that is the real Mount Sinai. That is Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses. This is a find of the century in my opinion because it's one of the landmarks, so to speak, of the whole story of the Exodus. And since the confirming evidence around this mountain is so remarkable, I'm personally convinced that Jabal El Laws is the Mount Sinai of the Bible. Something of major consequence took place at this site. That's the only explanation for finding this material, these structures, uh, at Jabal al -Laz. Something of great consequence took place there. That's, that's a given in my mind. I've always been told by a secular world that the Bible is myth and legend, allegories, ancient stories, fun, tell us a good moral message, but don't really apply to history. But when I stood on the scorched rocks, and I looked at the valley below. 
I saw all the things that the Bible talks about existing there. That flame that was a small little flicker in my heart became a burning flame. To this day, it still burns in my heart. God had people walk among us here. And Moses was real. Uh, religion isn't just uh, uh, some story that somebody wrote. This stuff really did take place. I realize that the Bible isn't just a compilation of good stories, but historical fact. And I think it's uh, just further testimony to God's active participation in human history. That the words printed on the pages of Scripture are God's words actually breathed upon its pages. The Bible has yet to be disproven in these matters. Uh, the more ar archaeological uh, discoveries we make, the more we see uh, the Bible being attested. The search for the real Mount Sinai is a journey that Bob Cornuke and Larry Williams will never forget. Larry continues today as a successful market trader and adventurer. Bob has devoted his life to search for further discoveries that prove the Bible to be true. He is the president of the Bible Archaeology Search and Exploration Institute. Their bond of friendship remains to this day, and neither man will ever forget Jabal al the mountain of God. Yes, archaeology is a relatively new science. There are 25,000 sites, locations, people mention of the Bible. Not one find has ever disproved the Bible or contradicted the Bible. Really, I think we'll have a better understanding of the future the more we know about the past. So to find out these things about who once walked on the earth, uh, uh, to confirm religious beliefs uh, is really fascinating. I, I hope we're able to accomplish some of it. Uh, and if we don't, I'm sure if somebody else does. I think that the evidence is out there today for us to find if only we are willing to look. God has revealed himself throughout history. His fingerprints are on humanity. And if we look and if we search, we will find the evidence and we will find the answers. presentation of Real Productions. To order additional copies of the search for the real Mount Sinai, call 800-680-3300.